Good morning. morning. Welcome to Pastor Grove Beach uh, Community Church, United Church of Christ, where we always like to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today is a uh, special Sunday for us in the sense that so much is coming together to make it um, hopefully a good and inspiring service for you all. We are commemorating September 11th. We're commemorating the end of a 20-year war. And when we're doing something like this, it's, it's very important to honor the day, honor uh, the victims as we look back and commemorate. But it's also important to look forward. It's also it, uh, critical that, 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 that we face in, in a new direction to a new day with the lessons that we have learned. For those of you who may want to um, commemorate the day even further, I invite you to our uh, 7.30 beach service. It'll be right off the ramp of 17th Avenue. And there at the beach, a few of us gather, and we'll have a few prayers that have been written by other uh, scholars and and clergy members uh, commemorating uh, September 11th. And then afterwards, we'll relax and watch the sunset and enjoy each other's company. So you're welcome to, to that as well. So today is the day that the Lord has made. Today is the day that we gather as a community of faith. Let us prepare ourselves for worship by listening to the prelude. rage and foam. The Lord of hosts is with us still. God is our refuge and strength. You may be seated.
streets that paths adorn I take. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Then, out of the formless void, God said, Let there be light. And spreading outward in every direction, the universe came into being, light and matter racing outward. And today, at the outer expanding edge of the universe, God's voice echoes on, as it has done for the last 14 billion years. Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. Four and a half billion years ago, the Earth was born in light, in fire, formed from the collisions of countless asteroids. And on the surface of the Earth, there was nothing but burning molten rock, the same temperature as the sun. As the Earth cooled and a crust of rock formed on the surface, ice-rich asteroids and comets struck the face of the Earth, and water vapor rose from its core, and thick clouds obscured the rock planet, and it rained and rained and rained for millions of years. And when the clouds began to clear four billion years ago, the planet was covered in a massive green ocean and the skies were made of carbon dioxide. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that that was good. As volcanoes erupted under the green ocean, the magma quickly cooled and granite was born. It floated on the heavy volcanic rock and the land rose out of the ocean and continents were formed. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation and in the shallow seas on the edge of the continents, life came to be. And it took its energy from the sun and used the carbon dioxide of the sky, and it gave off oxygen. And for two billion years, photosynthesizing bacteria bubbled oxygen through the oceans, turning them blue. And it filled the sky with oxygen, turning it blue. And an atmosphere was formed. 
Then, 700 million years ago, the young continents drifted together and blocked the movement of the oceans over the poles, and the poles froze for the first time, and ice spread out over the face of the planet. For 50 million years, an ice sheet a mile thick covered the whole face of the planet, and almost all life went extinct. Then, as volcanoes split apart the supercontinent, the ice melted, and the continents drifted so that there were shallow seas between them. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. And out of the destruction, life bloomed in the waters as never before, sea creatures that fed on other creatures. And there were at that time, 500 million years ago, more different kinds of living creatures than have ever existed on the planet since. And the atmosphere was finally dense enough to protect life from the destructive rays of the sun. And 300 million years ago, life came up out of the water, first plants and then creatures. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. The first age of land life was the age of the insects. Massive insects swarmed the tropical jungles of Earth. Then the amphibians came into being, and massive amphibians dwelt in the jungles. And then life was tested with another mass extinction. 250 million years ago, an age of volcanoes began, and volcanoes erupted constantly for a million years, spewing poisonous gas that blocked the sun and forming a new supercontinent of lava. The barren supercontinent broke apart and the pieces are the continents we know today. And while they were still close together, separated by shallow seas, life flourished again upon the earth. So, God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every single bird of the, every kind, and God saw that it was good. From the wreckage of extinction rose the largest and most notorious creatures ever to walk or swim on the planet, the dinosaurs, who in turn gave rise to birds. Then, 65 million years ago, a massive asteroid six miles across struck the Caribbean. Dust and debris from the impact rained down over the whole Earth. At the same time, massive volcanic eruptions began, filling the skies with thick poisonous gases. The clouds of debris and gas blocked out the sun, and the jungles died, and with them, all the dinosaurs. And as the poisonous clouds cleared, life returned again to the earth, and the age of mammals began. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. Two million years ago, the ancestors of humans came into being in East Africa. At that time, a land bridge connecting North and South America rose out of the ocean, and Panama blocked the flow of tropical water over the poles, and the poles froze once again. And the ice age in which we are still living began. Humans adapted to the ice and used it to spread out over the face of the earth and the ice came and went in cycles for thousands of years. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. 10,000 years ago, humans began to cultivate plants and raise animals. And with agriculture was born civilization. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And it was so. The work of creation has not stopped. Everywhere in the universe, from its outer edge to its core, the redemptive work of creation continues, bringing life and beauty from destruction and nothingness. 
The cycle of death and life, destruction and creation continues. God saw everything that was made, and indeed, it was very good. A reading from the book of Genesis. Our Creator God took the first man, Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And then God thought, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, God took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And God brought her to the man. 
The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. When Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Then their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then Adam and Eve heard the sound of God as God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God among the trees of the garden. But God called out, Oh, Adam, where are you? <laughs> and Adam answered, I heard you, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. sent me a TikTok, and it was about somebody um, talking about the very first few words in the book of Genesis, and explaining something that I learned back in seminary, and that scholars have known for some time, but that in church we really do not bother with. And that is that the very first few words in the book of Genesis, you may know them as in the beginning, when in reality, it should read in a beginning. So think about the difference in that article, a versus the. Now, how do we know this? Well, first of all, because the word the did not exist in the Hebrew language for many centuries later. And so it is more likely that they did not use that article and that instead it was written as in a beginning. Now think about the many different ways we could interpret the work of God now. How many different ways that we could see that there are new beginnings and that every beginning gives off a different path. And so that in this beginning, things may have gone in that direction, but in that other beginning, things may have gone in a completely different way. Regardless of whether it's in a beginning or in the beginning, the church hasn't really bothered with that because the stories in Genesis are really one big metaphor. They are considered to be myth that was created to help explain the creative side of God and how God may have created the world. In other words, to counter some of the creation stories of their days. And so today's creation stories, first read to us by Vanessa and Vaughn, incorporated and I weaved into it science. And then later on, Sydney wrote, Cindy wrote, uh, she read for us uh, the stories of Adam and Eve and how Adam hid from God. How it is that in his shame, he experienced some self-loathing <clears throat> And he hid. Now many of you know that I like the theater. A good play, well written, and superbly directed can teach lessons to an audience in ways that a book cannot. 
The playwright in me is seeing the events of the last 20 years, beginning with 9-11 and leading right up to this very day, as what could be a magnificent play to teach the most critical of lessons to a new generation of Americans. So we don't have those resources nor that time. I don't have the kind of stage and actors to help that play unfold as I see it in my mind. So I'm going to have to rely on your powers of imagination and on my descriptive words. That together, we might be able to imagine a stage set before us. The cast of characters and the songs that might emerge from that musical into a sermon weaving it all together. Won't you please pray with me? May the words from my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace be with you on this day. And also with you. Do you remember the feeling of disbelief on 9-11? The curtain rose, suddenly revealing right before our eyes a shocking display of violence. Do you remember those first few hours, everybody asking, how can this be? What is happening? Many of us were spectators seated in the audience, enjoying our morning when these horrific scenes transpired before our very eyes. And then, stage right, entered the many heroes. People across the nation donated blood, neighbors reaching out to neighbors, and even those of us who were not directly affected by the act of terrorism sang a song of grief along with the rest of the nation. 9-11 became one of those days that divided time. From that day forth, life would be described as before 9-11 or after 9-11. I remember people saying that 9-11 could have been avoided if only America had, as a nation, been more compassionate and less imperial. When I heard those words, I have to tell you, I couldn't believe my ears. How dare they? How dare they speak such words, suggesting that we brought this upon ourselves? And that's when the anger kicked in. A new song was sung now, one that stimulated the blood and the roots, and we rooted on for the soldiers that were being sent off to war. then, life continued, and despite the war, and despite the global conflict, at the individual level, each and every one of us, our own challenges arose, our own limitations came forth, our own fears and doubts that we had to struggle with were part of the reality. Stage left, enter a woman that we all know. Her story is familiar and all too common. We have all met her because, sadly, she is in every community. She might even be in our own homes. We look at the playbill and we see that she has no name because, in many ways, she is all of us. The woman stands in center stage, still not yet a woman, on the verge of being one beautiful, outgoing, and cheerful teenage girl. The director has choreographed a musical where multiple boys want to dance with her. Can you see her now, twirling from one side of the stage to the next, being taken by the hand? And then girls, all of them, wanting to be her friend because she is popular, she's smart. When this young teenage girl laughs and smiles, everybody else also does the same. She is somewhat flirtatious in an innocent sort of way, which is all that much more appealing. And now the stage changes drastically. Time sweeps in. Light and wind let us know that the passage of time is sudden and the beautiful young woman now stands before the audience draped in black. She's almost unrecognizable, having lost her smile, charm, and charisma She's no longer dancing. Something happened and she lost the best parts of herself. 
and somehow transformed into a bitter and angry woman. She sings her song, and we learn during that song that in her university years, she was repeatedly raped by other young men who belonged to fraternities and sports teams. Young men who mistook her cheerful flirtations as an invitation for, for a violation. Enter the stage, the authorities, the men draped very seriously, and she, all broken, approaches them. These were men more concerned about the image of the university and their polo team than with her well-being. They accused her of bringing this upon herself. And the boys that raped her, well, they walked away with a slap on the wrist. This infuriates the young woman, and her resentment eventually over time disfigures her, so that even someone seated far away in the nosebleed section of the theater can see her all sad, can see that transformation into an unrecognizable person. Like many rape victims, the woman developed a mistrust of men, and the slightest disagreement with a man brought out an unreasonable response. For her, life is now divided. Life is divided into before the rape and after the rape. Life is now in black and white. You are either with us or you're against us. You are either with me or you are my perpetrator. One side, there are men with the need to stay in power, and on the other, women who are victims of the men. Enter now, stage right, our American spirit, caught off guard by the planes that crash into our communities and lives. And this spirit is personified by actors who are standing with a limp. They're hurting. They are somehow or another still moving, but not as before, having suffered a violation. And then here come the heroes, those who are determined to help, those who are determined to rebuild and create a better tomorrow. These heroes come in from the rear of the stage, and they help those who embody the American spirit. But the music changes, and you begin to hear an ominous, ominous, dark spirit entering from behind, from behind the dark background, promoting a division and blame. It pushes aside the heroes and it moves to center stage seeking to become the lead role. And so the stage is now divided because our world and our communities are divided. On one side of the division is a wrongful spirit that grows unchecked, promoting hate speech neighbors turning against neighbors, and government legislators refusing to work with each other. And when we aren't angry, we're indifferent and superficial. Stage front, enter the Kardashians. Enter all the vain and superficial things that we distract ourselves with so that we do not have to think about the grief and the pain that we may have suffered. And so it is that consumerism hits an all-time high, and people quickly fill their minds with nonsense while our soldiers fought a war in two fronts. And that's when a new character steps forward, a narrator, a wise person dressed in white who looks at the audience and asks an introspective question. Is war the only way of ensuring peace? What lessons can we draw from this conflict, from these last 20 years? What lessons will we learn? The narrator brings in a passage from the Bible, a story of creation classified as a myth. It's the story of Adam doing what he knows that he shouldn't be doing and then hiding it from God. He did not want God to see his sin, nor did he want to face it himself. And in so doing, he created a larger sin. Adam's shame led 
to self-loathing, which became unbearable. For you see, self-loathing is a rejection of our Creator God. How could such a beautiful being not love itself? The audience is smart. It sees the genius in the Genesis story as a lesson that describes the human condition. It's the story of lost innocence, of how we lose the best parts of ourselves and in the process become separated from God. Paradise is not so much a fictional place, but rather a harmonious state of being, a harmonious state of loving. The overwhelming message of the creation story is that God looked at what had been created and God thought that it was good. God is pleased with every living creature in creation, and that includes us. Regardless of what we, we may have done, regardless of how we may have failed, we are loved by God. And a new voice is heard in the theater of life. It's the voice of God calling out for us. What will we do? Will we be like Adam and hide? Or will we step forward? The narrator brings in science to the stage. The orchestra and string quartet play a riveting piece as common ground is built between the two fields. The audience looks on with a deeper understanding and appreciation for the poetic weaving of science and faith. And we smile when we see how science has reached the same conclusion as our faith. The universe is still expanding and worlds are still being created. In other words, the Creator is still creating, not just in faraway galaxies, but here on Earth, here in our lives. It's a matter of training the eye. God could take a volcanic explosion and turn it into a field of flowers. Stage left enters the woman with a knife and a song of despair. She has lost hope and begins to cut herself in an act of self-loathing. The heroes enter stage right and stage front, and they intervene. And the song is one that inspires and convinces the woman to get some help. And she puts the knife down and goes to therapy. And then the stage revolves, and so do the lights with it. And a new setting is now on center stage. It's a setting that we recognize. It's a setting that we sit in Sunday after Sunday. A church with its pews and its prayers and a choir singing songs of hope. The woman recognizes that she needs hope in her life and so she walks feebly into the church and sits in the back hoping to not be noticed. The lights change and the passage of time is represented once again by swirling movements and we see our broken woman slowly moving forward to the center of the church, slowly becoming part of the community, slowly healing. And she stands and sings a song of forgiveness, not just for the perpetrators who violated her, but to that lovely child that at one time existed and wore pigtails. She forgives herself. The power of forgiveness is in the release that follows. With sweeping motions, the woman is able to let go of her pain and in so doing, recovers the joy in her life. The volcanic explosions of anger yield to a field of love as she finds new purpose in her life. And the curtain falls, the end. Sounds like a good play, don't you think? I don't know if I could find funding for it. I don't know exactly how many actors I'll need for this. I'm sure I could string Dale along to play the music. But this is not theater. In reality, this is our reality. This has been our life for the last 20 years. As we look back, we could see how 9-11 was the end of an era and now a new one is beginning. We could see how the spirit of division and blame grew like a cancer, making us unrecognizable to ourselves. We could see how we were violated, how we were
were broken and we needed to find healing or else we would continue to lose ourselves. And so time has put our war to rest. The time has come to heal and restore the best parts of ourselves. The spirit of division and the blame that has plagued, plagued us still remains. It just has found new targets. Truth and fact are now optional as people choose to believe uh, alternate set of facts. Medicinal science is portrayed as the enemy of human rights and our own democratic institutions are threatened by insurrectionists who claim to be patriots. If 9-11 was akin to an act of rape, then January 6 is the epitome of self-loathing. We watched our neighbors and fellow citizens attack the best part of our nation. And we watched with shock and horror, the same shock and horror that we felt when the planes flew into the Twin Towers. Both days are emblematic of something wrong, but this time the threat is not an external force. The enemy is not a stranger who does not understand our ways. In many ways, the enemy is within. My friends, we cannot continue like this. It is time to end what is destroying us and start anew. It is time to heal. Anger and strife will not make things better. Pointing the finger and attaching blame does not help anyone come on board. Shaming people into doing what you think they need to do is only going to drive them away. The answer is what we have known all along. The answer is in the love. Only love can heal. Only love can unite. Only love can bring us together. Jesus commanded that we ought to love our neighbor, not because it sounded pretty or it was poetic, but because Jesus knew it was the only way to transform the heart. This is the time to usher in a new era of cooperation and collaboration. Now that the war is over, let us rebuild what hate has burned down. May the volcanic explosions which disfigured our soul yield to a field of flowers. And all this in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. No matter who you are or where you are in your journey of life, this table is open to you. Regardless of anything that might separate you from this table, or from the love of God, let it not stand in your way. Let it not be a division at this time. And so it is that I invite you now to join me in the liturgy for the sacrament of Holy Communion. The bread and cup are before us, the memory of a meal, the story which shapes us, the grieving and the pain, the seeking and the loving. God made us unique human creatures, created to love and be loved. We give thanks for all that holds us together in our humanity. We remember that meal so long ago behind closed doors. When Jesus welcomed the twelve to his table, he broke bread and gave it to his friends, saying, 
take, eat. This is my body given for a new life and a new hope. I invite you. This is the bread of life. Take now and eat. And he lifted the cup and said, Drink from this cup, for you are welcomed at my table. My life is poured out that you may be whole and know that you are loved. Let's drink together in the remembrance of the church we have known together. This is the cup of the new covenant. Let us drink now. Please join me in a time of prayer. Good and gracious God, mother and father to us all, on this day we remember atrocious, horrific event that changed our nation, changed our lives, destroyed so much, an act of violence and an act of hate. And as we saw this horrible event unfolding, we cried out to you, O oh God. We cried out to you and, and prayed that your spirit would help us. And so it is, O oh God, that you answered our prayers and you sent in the valiant, you sent in the courageous, the first responders, the police officers, the fire department, and the paramedics, and all those who were able, unafraid to die and willing to sacrifice themselves, they rushed in to save lives. And for that we are grateful, O oh God. And then the towers fell and time passed and our mourning echoed. And in our grief, we cried out to you, O God, and asked why, O oh why, O oh God, have you forsaken us? And you heard our prayers and you sent in the comforters. You sent in those that would hold our hands and pray with us. You sent in those that would sing a song of hope you sent in those that would sit with us in silence and help us heal from this violent act. And then as our anger grew, we began to wage war. And the war became dehumanizing, not only to its victims, but to those who were a part of it as well. And our soldiers suffered from a post-traumatic stress disorder. And entire communities were affected. Victims and dead people were everywhere. And we cried out to you once again, O oh God. And you heard our cries and you sent in the peacemakers. And those peacemakers went, went to the front lines and they went to the tables where decisions are made. And we recognize, O oh God, that we did not listen to those peacemakers. We recognize, O oh God, that this war lasted for far too long. We recognize that we were not rewarded with war and much of that world still remains the same. And so it is, O oh God, that after 20 years, now we look up to you and we lift up our prayers once again. And you are answering our prayers and you send the church, and you send the prophets of the church so that we might learn the lessons that need to be learned so that new generations do not have to fight and suffer as ours has.
And so it is that on this day, as we mourn the many casualties, as we mourn the many wrongful decisions, as we mourn the worst side of humanity that reared its ugly head, may you help us. May you help us find that which is best in us, that which is the best part of all of us, the love and the kindness and the compassion that makes us beautiful in your eyes. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. with each and every one of us, may we find a new beginning on this day for a world that is hungry for our love. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.